Hello, and thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, I'm going to try to get through as many questions as we can get through in an hour. But first, I want to say hi to you, Mom and Dad, Dr. McDougal and Mary. How are you? Hi, good we're good. Pretty good. Great to see you. Well, thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> So, so unless you have something you want to talk about, I thought it would be fun to start talking about weight loss because we just had our first uh, talk in the McDougal's Medicine series on weight loss yesterday, and it went really well. I got lots of great comments from people about how well thought out it was, how well researched it was. So I thought it would be great to start talking about weight loss. Well, you know, Heather, I, I what, the way I write a book or I, I put a, a video talk together is, you know, I just put a few words on the paper or a few pictures on the paper, and I just keep redoing it and redoing it and redoing it until I get to the point where I think it's pretty pretty good. And uh, I got to that point yesterday when the weight loss lecture, <clears throat> we talked about hunger. You know, I challenge people to try and learn about hunger. I think that's the most important thing is for people to realize what hunger is all about. I mean, you think about it. Well, I talked to them about the Minnesota starvation experiment where they went hungry for six months, these conscientious objectors did. And you went through, you saw the pain and suffering these poor men went through, 36 of them. And, and you know, at the end of that particular segment of the talk, I gave the people a challenge. I said, how about, how about you finding out what hunger is really all about? And I gave them a, a little discussion about our history and what we went through well, about 35 years ago. It was uh, in reference to starving people in Africa. You know, everything on the news was about starving people in Africa. And we were involved in a congregation where we had people who were friendly and cooperative. <laughs> and what I suggested we do is we go for the weekend, you know, start Friday night, and go until Sunday afternoon, and not eat, just have water. And I got about half of the group to go along with me. And it was, it was an unbelievable experience. I encourage you to try it if you're in good health and not a child, is find out how powerful this hunger drive is. Well, you know, our experience was Friday night. Remember, this is the weekend. Friday night was no big deal. Saturday morning, ah, I, didn't think, I didn't think it would be any trouble at all. You know, it was uh, 12 hours past and just a few hours to go. By Saturday afternoon, I started thinking about food by Saturday evening. I mean, it's 24 hours. I had no more money problems. I wasn't, wasn't worried about, uh, about any relationship that I had. I had only one thought on my mind. And one of the things that come, came out from the Minnesota starvation experiment, experiment is a, a statement, you know, a phrase. A hungry person can only see food. Okay, so you've got some options. You can be hungry, not eat, go through semi-starvation suffer all the time. You can go on a low carb diet and go into ketosis and suppress your hunger drive. Or you can take one of these semi-glutides like uh, Wagovi and uh, what's the other one? Quim oh, um, Wagovi. Oh man. Oh, tomorrow oh. is when someone tomorrow, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. That's a good one. Anyway, you could take those. This is uh, from Gila Monster Venom. That's a little monster, lives in the southwest, southwest of the United States, and they drive some drugs uh, off of, um, you know, the, all these, uh, uh, they're semi-glutides is what they are. And uh, they're the ones that are selling for $1,000 a month that you can buy. that will cause you to lose weight. Why do they cause you to lose weight? Because they make you sick. In other words, you get rid of that powerful hunger drive. So I explained to people, here's your choice. You can be in pain which I know people fear greatly. They won't go 24 hours without food. Or you can go into ketosis, which is the low-carb scheme. Or you can take these uh, semi-glutides, like going Govi and whatever. I got so many of them out now. <laughs> thousand bucks a month. And you can get poisoned by Gila Monster, which takes care of your hunger drive. Really, people are sick. They have gastrointestinal problems. They vomit. They have nausea. Oh, you know how they sell this? It's kind of interesting. These drugs are sold with the idea that they delay gastric emptying. You know, that's what they say. That You know, the sexy science is uh, uh, it changes hormones that are related to appetite, like ghrelin and, you know, insulin, et cetera. And 
they say that's the reason it works. And then they go on to say it delays gastric emptying. Well, the problem that we're running into these days is that the stomach doesn't empty and the food stays in the stomach for not just hours, but days and it rots. You know? And these people get this stinky breath. And there's one teacher who was describing that her students couldn't stand to be near her because of when she was on this drug, she had such a foul, foul breath. All right, so you can be hungry, you can go into ketosis, you can take a little Gila monster poisoning, or you can go through bariatric surgery and still be hungry. <laughs> That's the problem with bariatric surgery, you know, where they rearrange your intestinal tract, and you're still hungry. And that's why people will go on these particular routes, they go to surgery, then they try the low carb diets and go into ketosis to lose, keep the weight off. And, then they try these uh, semi-glutides. Uh, uh, Ozempi. That's the name of it. Ozempi. Yeah, Ozempi. Oh, that's, that's the common one. You go on those for a while, and that makes them sick for a while. And then they, they hit a plateau, and the body will only tolerate so much of you being sick and not eating. So you hit a plateau at about uh, one and a half years, 68 weeks. You've lost 37 pounds. It's cost you $17,000. Anyway, so... You're still hungry when you have these surgeries. So you have to go that route. You either suffer from hunger, go into ketosis, or make yourself uh, sick with the healing monster poisoning. Or, 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 the end of the lecture was you <laughs> could eat. You know, there's nothing wrong with the hunger drive. There's nothing wrong with the size of your stomach. You're, you're not psychologically damaged. Well, maybe you are, but it is, isn't related <laughs> to your weight. You know, eat, and there's got to be a there's got to be a way that you can set it. The hunger drive is not made defective as a punishment for the human being. And I just see God saying, "Oh boy, I, I don't like people. I'm I'm going to make them suffer all the time. I'll let them be hungry up. Oh man, how silly." Anyway, uh, so the lecture kind of ends up with what we get together every every um, Sunday at five o'clock to talk about, or but we try and teach people in our twelve day program is look, you can suffer if you want. You know, you can make yourself sick if you want. You can have surgery if you want. But the only way to solve the problem is get your get good health, you know, uh, satisfy your hunger drive, win a, win a race, you know, have arteries that are clean, not infest your breasts and uteruses and prostates with cancer. You can do that by eating the right kind of food. Which brings me to what I wanted to talk to you about tonight, Heather. The United Nations came out today and said this is the era of global boiling, global boiling. Okay, I, I know uh, you don't like me to talk about this, Heather. Uh, you know, I know you folks don't like to hear about this, but good grief, you've got to be blind and deaf and lock yourself in a closet not to understand what's going on. The boiling, the heat, the droughts, the Wildfires. I mean, are, you know, aren't you? I don't know. I mean, aren't you scared? I mean, wouldn't you listen to anybody who had an option for you? Well, what I spent this week doing was interviewing what I think, and listen to me carefully. I know you don't want to hear this. Maybe you do, because I think there's an option. Well, we're way past controlling CO2 by electric vehicles and transportation and et cetera. We're way past that. So much CO2 in the atmosphere, forget it. The doctor's name is Yi Tao. And I've been working with him for a couple of years now. In fact, I did an interview with him last July, a year ago, July. So it's been over a year. Yi Tao put together an organization called MIR. Write this down, M-E-E-R dot org. And I want you to, if you're interested at all in doing something about what is upon us right now, global boiling. If you're interested at all, you go to the MIR website, M-E-E-R.org. And what uh, Yi Tao tells us, and he's a scientist, he's a very, very, very smart guy. In fact, that I think is one of his difficulties is he's so smart, it's hard for him to talk to the common person. But anyway, I did an interview with him, and we're going to put together, uh, put this out in, to our followers and Instagram wherever we can. What Yi Tao proposes is this. You uncouple heat from CO2. CO2 is, we're way past that. We're, you know, 30 to a thousand years way past that. 
but what can we do about the heat? You know, people have thought about various ways, like we could put uh, reflective materials up in the atmosphere, but that's been associated with some real, real climate disasters. So what Yitao has done, he's, he's we're right now working out of uh, Freetown in Africa. Uh, what he's done is put together a workable plan. It's not going to be easy. Not going to be easy, but it's something that can work. And that is by building mirrors. Yeah, mirrors, you know, reflective surfaces. You've got to cover 2% of the planet with mirrors. These mirrors are made out of um, leftover aluminum cans and plastic bottles. And they're extremely economical to put together. And what these mirrors do is they reflect the energy back out into outer space and lower the temperature. And he's showing that right now in homes and in villages and in hectares of land. They're building mirrors and they're cooling the home or the land area by reflecting the energy back out in outer space. Excuse me, I don't know of anything else that we can do. Anyway, this is a project. You get China, India, United States, et cetera, uh, working on this. I think we could do it. Etal thinks we could do it. I think we could make a difference. I think we can save the planet for the future. Okay, there's the challenge. I know you didn't <laughs> want to hear it, except you don't have any choice. You can't walk outside. You can't turn on the TV. You can't listen to the radio. You can't read the, not read the newspaper. And, and I fail to realize this is the era of global boiling, past warming, global boiling. You can do something about it. I can do something about it. I risk losing you as a follower by telling you this, because you don't want to hear it, but you do. I know you do. And if you spread the good news and we've got, you know, what do we have? We've got 10,000 people who listen to this show every Sunday night. You're going to tell your friends. You're going to tell 10 of your friends. You know, some of them will listen. And, you know, we might be able to spread the word. There's an option. And I spent this past week interviewing Yi Tao and putting together the lecture that we're going to put up on. Instagram. But that's what I wanted to tell people about, Heather. Uh, doesn't fit in with the subject matter exactly, except that you've trusted me before. You've realized that I can see things uh, clearly. And uh, I share with you a message that most of you think is the true message, the honest message. And I'm trying to share with you again. There's an option. You've got to tell your friends and relatives. It's something we could do. We can afford it. We've got the manpower to do it. We can cool this planet. That's what I wanted to say. Now questions, Heather. <laughs> Thank you. Yeetow, near, M-E-E-R, org, M-E-E-R dot org. Write it down. Great. Thank you. Okay, lots of questions coming in while you're talking. So first one, this is from Jolie. A friend was just diagnosed with stage three kidney disease. He was told not to eat potatoes due to their high phosphorus content. Do you agree with this? No, no. The phosphorus in plants, in plant foods, is uh, not easily released into the body. That, that's where one of the mistakes is. Uh, people worry about phosphorus buildup by feeding plants, which have a lot of phosphorus, but it's, it's complex. It doesn't get into the body in any, uh, in any significant amount. What they need to worry about is they need to worry about potassium. You know, sodium and potassium, these are, these are cations. And they build up in the system to the point where uh, people with kidney failure die of potassium toxicity. Normal potassium is about four to five uh, micro equivalents. And uh, if it gets up to around five or six, which is typical with people who have stage three or four kidney failure, it's okay. It's not until it gets past seven, the potassium level, that you mm -hmm. run into cardiac arrhythmias and you die. I, you know, again, I, I suppose I'm in that mood tonight to be, to be bold and to give you an answer that you not necessarily want to hear. But, you know, when you lose your kidneys, you know, there's part of nature that selects the weak out. And one of the kind ways to die would be a high potassium level. It would be basically painless. Whereas half the people who have this level of kidney failure, stage three or four, half of them never make it to a dialysis ward. They die of heart disease. And in the meantime, they get operated on, they suffer terribly. You know, they go through pure 
you know what. So uh, that's what happens. Now you have to give them the option because there is oh. something they can do. Oh yeah, you can eat our diet. <laughs> You, listen, uh, we have been, I mean, this is this is old news. This this approach has been around for a hundred years. Uh, Dr. Adis is the father of kidney disease. Uh, he worked on this 50 years ago. So this is not new news. Every doctor should and does know about this, is you can change your diet and you can slow or stop the progression of kidney disease. So this person has a stage three, stage three okay? That's probably a creatinine of around 20 to 30 milligrams per deciliter. You know, which represents, say, about 30% of kidney function. You could survive on 25% of your kidneys. So if you just prevent them from getting worse, which you can do by eating a healthy diet, then you've got many years left ahead of you. And you can slow your 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 venture, your adventure, your trip to the dialysis ward, which I describe as pure hell on earth. You want to be convinced to eat the McDougal diet, huh? You want to be convinced? Ask your doctor to give you a tour through the dialysis ward. And you say, well, let's see, I could eat rice and wheat and corn, various dishes that the McDougals love eating with a, a little bit of uh, vegetable matter and a little bit of fruit. I got to be careful about the fruit and the vegetables because of the potassium. Or I could spend four hours a day, three days a week, attached to a machine that sucks my body to try and make it clean enough to survive. That's a tough life. You, you think eating oatmeal for breakfast is a tough life? No, I think it could get worse. So, anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I guess you shouldn't have started me out this way, Heather. <laughs> I don't think it's going to be a. I think I don't know, I'll, I'll try and calm down. <laughs> All right, next question. This is from Go Vegan. Uh, their doctor told me their liver has some slight fattiness to it. Also, their bilirubin is high. What should they do? Well, bilirubin is a a blood pigment. Uh, it, when the blood cells get metabolized. Uh, they produce bilirubin when they're, you know, in the process of being destroyed and the waste products getting rid of the body. They they release bilirubin and bilirubin is filtered by the liver. If the liver is not working well, then the liver is not doing as good a job as it could. And the bilirubin level increases in the bloodstream. So what we need to do is get the liver functioning well to lower the bilirubin level. Uh, the way you get the the liver functioning well, particularly since you told me that you have fatty infiltration of the liver, is you uh, stop eating fat. I mean, you can't switch to vegetable fat. The research has been done when you switch to omega-3 fats, which I know that's, that's the big rage, you go on good fats and everything be fine. It's not fine. The, uh, the fatty infiltration does not resolve because you're just eating another kind of fat. And not only does that get uh, you know stuffed into your buttocks, thighs, and abdomen, Get stuffed in your organs like your liver. So you correct the problem by eating a low fat diet. It's essentially. Uh, well, I mean, you, no, the liver is one organ that actually regenerates, right? So if you yeah. feed it well, it can actually get better. You can, you can lose a high percentage of your liver. I won't guess what the number is, but it is one of those organs that regenerates. And so you have a great chance of full recovery in a normal lifespan. There are organs that don't regenerate, like the brain. Kill the brain, it's dead. Or the heart. Kill the heart, it's dead. But the liver can regenerate itself. So, you know, that's what you need to do. And I want to take a little side note here, Heather, because uh, when the subject of Billy Room comes up, we should discuss something called Gilbert's syndrome. G-I-L-B-R-T apostrophe S. Gilbert's syndrome, which uh, is a family trait. Let's just say that. I wouldn't call it an inherited condition because you think maybe it's going to come out of disease. But it's within the spectrum of normal and it kind of runs in families. Uh, they had naturally high, have a high uh, bilirubin level. When you eat, the way you can tell that this is due to Gilbert's syndrome and not any liver disease or any other disease, is you can feed them a high carbohydrate diet and the bilirubin comes down. Uh, that's one way. The other thing you do is you can check the other liver function tests like ALT and SGOT and 
SGPT, and there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and if they're all normal, it's just the bilirubin that's up, then likely you have the Gilbert syndrome, which is nothing to worry about, except you will be frightened if you get a lab test back and you have a doctor who doesn't know about Gilbert's, which I can't imagine. It's got to be taught in every medical school, school to every student. It's so common. Yeah. Okay, next question. This is from Andrew. He doesn't understand why if you consume excess starch calories without fat, particularly from bread and pasta, why that won't cause weight gain. Well, <laughs> the question is why can you why why will bread and pasta not cause weight gain? Correct. Because the body can function well on uh, wheat. Yeah, it does well on wheat. I mean, good grief. We're, we're talking about the breadbasket of the world where they grew wheat and they lived on wheat for thousands of years in Egypt and other parts of the world. Nobody was overweight. The body can handle that. It uh, And what happens when you eat excess carbohydrate, which is what is wheat's made of? When you eat excess carbohydrate, what happens is that excess is burned off as heat. Heat exhale through your lungs, body heat, jittering motions, and so on. Carbohydrate, sugar, even pure white sugar, is not turned into fat readily. It's called de novo lipogenesis. So if you eat enough carbohydrate sugar to run the machinery, and then you eat a little bit more, it's not going to be converted, the sugar, into fat. In other words, through de novo, the new production, lipogenesis of fat. That's what it's called. De novo lipogenesis is insignificant in the human being. So when you eat extra calories, uh, the carbohydrate type, the body just burns them off. If you bring, eat extra calories of fat, can you imagine what happens to the fat? The fat you eat the fat you wear. It just moves it effortlessly to convert, just to go into a little bit of detail. If you are going to do these metabolic equations, and you are going to convert carbohydrate into fat, it takes 30% of the energy to make that conversion. That's wasteful. Body doesn't do that under normal circumstances. If you're going to move fat from your fork and spoon to your buttocks, abdomen, or thigh, it costs 3% of the calories. Body will do that, no trouble at all. Now, cows and pigs, they're different. They're, they're food animals. They have a... Uh, a significant ability to convert carbohydrate to fat, de novo lipogenesis. So, you know, that's what happens. So where you might be getting dissuaded a little bit on the idea that breads and bagels and pastas uh, make it more difficult to lose weight is in a way they do. And the reason is maybe not pasta because that's been rehydrated with water. The reason is, is because the calorie concentration that we call calorie density is doubled. When you take the wheat berry, you know, the, it's a little, little shell, right? Wheat berry. And you grind it up and you turn it into a powder called flour. You increase the calorie concentration by twofold. In other words, instead of it being one calorie per gram, which wheat berry is, it's two calories per gram. Because the maximum weight loss program, we tell people that refined foods are going to make it harder for you to lose weight. It's better to eat the food in its original form. So that may, may have come from that type of discussion that we have, but for the average run of the mill person, you're not gonna gain weight on Well, don't bread. you also think though, it's, it's the typical thing that you hear from people, especially when they're first changing over the way they eat and they eat, they have, maybe they have 50 pounds to lose, okay? And so what they're going to do now is they're going to eat the way we recommend, mm -hmm. but they're going to eat um, uh, like bread and pastas and things like that. Still, you know, starches, vegetables, and fruits and without any added fats. Yes. But if you, if you ate enough of that, you wouldn't lose um, fat. Right. Near all I'm trying to say. What you're trying to say is calories count. Yeah. So if you consume like too much sugar, you know, sugar is not turned into fat readily. Okay, it's the de novo lipogenesis thing again. If you eat sugar, the body's going to burn the sugar. It's going to leave the fat in the fat cells. 
Same thing with alcohol. You know, you, you have the idea that somehow you get a beer belly, a beer belly, right? From drinking beer. It's not a beer belly. That's a potato chip belly. Alcohol is not turned into fat. I mean, it's even more difficult to turn alcohol into fat than it is to turn sugar into fat. So why do people who drink uh, end up overweight? Well, they don't. Not if they're serious drinkers. I mean, think about the alcoholics that you know in your life who really consume a major part of their calories as alcohol. Are they overweight or trim? They're almost deathly trim. Okay, so that's the drunk. That's somebody who really gets the alcohol into their body. How about somebody who's a moderate, casual, maybe daily drinker? What happens to them? All right, they eat the alcohol. The body would rather burn alcohol than fat. It prefers, just like it prefers burning sugar as opposed to fat. So it leaves the fat in the fat cells. That's one thing that happens. The other thing that happens is uh, your inhibitions. What happens is you lose your inhibitions. And so as a result, it's not one potato chip. It's one bag of potato chips after a couple of beers. This is not a beer belly, ladies and gentlemen. This is a potato chip greasy belly. That's what it is. And, and people brag about it. They go, oh, I got this beer belly. Oh, look at me, a beer belly. Excuse me. It's because you, you, you only drank moderately. If you got to be real serious about your drinking, you'd lose the weight. <laughs> All right, one more, one more story. <laughs> Michigan State University which is where I graduated from medical school and undergraduate. Uh, back in uh, the late 60s, I graduated. Yeah. Michigan State University published a study in 1978 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, where they went to a dormitory like I lived in. I lived in Snyder Hall at Michigan State University. We had free food. All you had to do was walk through a cafeteria line and eat as much as you want, and I did. I mean, that's where I had my stroke when I was 18 years old. So they asked these moderately overweight men who were going through the cafeteria line, could eat as much as they wanted, could eat anything they wanted. All they asked them to do was eat 12 slices of bread a day. They had to do that. They had to eat the bread. It was either white bread or brown bread, 12 slices of bread a day. And at the end of uh, two months, 60 days, the average weight loss and those who consumed 12 slices of white bread a day Remember, they could still go through the cafeteria line, as much of the other stuff they wanted. There was no restriction. They just had to eat the bread. The average weight loss was 14 pounds. Those who ate the brown bread after two months, the average loss in weight was 19 pounds. You see, the bread displaced the fat in the pork chops and the bacon and the eggs that the person was getting walking through the cafeteria line at Snyder Hall. Because they weren't, they weren't hungry anymore because they ate the bread so they, they weren't tempted to eat the bacon and eggs. Right. That's what satisfied their hunger drive. Because the bread is high carbohydrate, which is the calorie source that satisfies the hunger drive. And it's a little fat. So no fat to wear. So, uh, you know, we throw that bread thing in just to help you if you're on the maximum weight loss program. Otherwise, bread is the staff of life, okay? And in countries around the world throughout history, it was not a mistake. You're a bread eater. You know, okay, next question. Thank you. Uh, okay, next question. This is from George. Uh, he's a 75 year old McDougaller, healthy, energetic, and on no medication. His blood pressure runs 135 over 78. Should I be on medication to lower it? No. Oh. <laughs> Sounds like blood pressure, doesn't it? Almost. No, no, the official recommendations, first of all, they're based upon studies that were done back in the 70s. Uh, at, they're, they're, they're the Veterans Administration studies. They took veterans and they took some veterans that were really, really sick. I mean, they, they were about to go into heart failure. They're about to have brain hemorrhages. I mean, their blood pressure was really high, like, you know, 240 over 140 millimeters of mercury. And they found that when they lowered their blood pressure using chlorothaladone, not any other drug, but chlorothaladone, that they were able to dramatically reduce their risk of heart failure and brain hemorrhages and dying. So they, they took those findings and they translated it into taking care of the general population. 
without doing any studies to support it. And uh, we're not, not any good studies to support it. So uh, what, what the bottom line is, we've come out with, with recommendations from three sources that I'm gonna tell you about. One is the Cochrane Collaboration, which you heard me talk about. There are a group of 40,000 scientists in over a hundred countries around the world who weigh in on the importance of particular findings in the research. Cochrane says that treating blood pressures of 160 over 100 or less with medication doesn't show any benefit. Maybe maybe 150 over 90. I mean, they, they don't go that far and we get really sick people. But treating blood pressures lower than that, no benefit. The National Health Service of Britain, in 2004, they started saying this. They still say it today, the National Health Service, is that if you have high blood pressure, and what they mean is a blood pressure of 160 over 100 or greater, sustained for months, then you should be put on blood pressure lowering medication. The last comes from uh, it comes from the Joint Committee on Treating Hypertension, the eighth, eighth Joint Committee. It's, it was published in the Journal of American Medical Association and represents the position of the American Medical Association. What they say is, if you're a man my age, you know I'm much older than that, but I think it's age sixty. If you're a man sixty. You should not start medication unless the blood pressure is 150 over 90 or greater. So there's consensus. You should not even think about medication unless your blood pressure is 160 over 100 or maybe 150 over 90. You even think about it. And if you start thinking about it, lower blood pressure, you're going to get into trouble. If somebody starts treating you and they treat you aggressively, what happens is you increase your risk of stroke and heart attack because you lower the pressure artificially with the drugs to the point where the perfusion pressure to the brain and the heart is decreased to the point where, as a result, you have an increased risk of stroke. If you lower it below, say 140 over 85 millimeters of mercury, you increase your risk of stroke two to four times. You increase your risk of heart attacks, dying of heart disease at least four times by a too aggressive a treatment. So, yeah, uh, no. Everything says no. I can't believe your doctors are offering that. And by the way, we're going to talk about this a little bit in our in two Saturdays from now when we give the when I give the lecture on heart disease. We'll talk about that. And I'll show you the references. I'll show you the, the science. But you can go find the science. You can find the science I just talked to you about. You can go to to YouTube. You can put in McDougall and hypertension. There's a whole lecture I gave on. I showed you all the research. You can read it. You can, find the National Health Service in Britain. You know, you can find all that. I put that out there for you. Next question. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Carol. She's wondering if blackstrap molasses is good to take for anemia. She has a red blood count of 10 and has been adding that to her water and hoping that it's going to help her. Well, I, I, I think the reputation is blackstrap molasses has more iron in it than, say, honey or white sugar. And that's where that comes from. When somebody has an anemia, and 10 is pretty important. I mean, you, when you're down to 10, they won't operate on you. Okay? Above 10, they'll take you to surgery, I mean, for elective surgery, but not below 10. So you're at a level where, you know, doctors are concerned. You have to get around 7 grams of hemoglobin to where you really notice it. Normal is about 12 to 15 grams uh, per milliliter. Okay, so you're at 10. You're at a level where your doctor should be instead of, and I don't understand your doctor is telling you this, instead of telling you to treat your problem with any iron source, which is might have happened if you've gone see the doctor, you gotta be on iron, you got iron deficiency anemia. What you need to do first, and every doctor knows this, this is as standard of medicine as you can possibly get. You need to look for the source of bleeding. It may be obvious, you know, you could be bleeding from a gash on your forehead. You know what the problem is. There are two sources of bleeding that you might not notice. One is through the gastrointestinal tract. You can lose significant amount of blood due to ulcers, cancers, diverticulosis, uh, you know, there are lots of things going on in the intestinal tract that you may not notice and you can lose a significant amount of blood. If you lose a lot of blood in the gastrointestinal tract and you have black tarry stools, 
they're not just dark, they're just, they're like tar. And that's, that's very significant. The other area that you might not notice the blood loss from would be in a woman through her vaginal bleeding. So your doctor first needs to look for the source of bleeding. Then what the doctor needs to do is stop the bleeding. <laughs> uh, well, the next thing would be, well, the diet I recommend has loads of iron in it. So you really don't have to supplement, but most doctors do in fact, you know, if I had somebody with a hemoglobin of 10, uh, I'd probably put them on an iron supplement, uh, one that's not constipating because iron is constipating and makes your stools black. So I, I might do that. I might put them on a source of iron. There, there are uh, vegan sources of iron and they're particularly good because they combine the iron, which is the ferrous kind of iron, which is not as well absorbed. That's the plant kind of iron. When you combine the ferrous iron that's in plants with ascorbic acid, which is in plants, then the iron is extremely well absorbed. The ferric form of iron is in animal foods. And I know this is a little more than you want to know, but you know, I, I might put you on a, a little iron supplement, but I don't, if I was serious about it, I wouldn't go blackstrap molasses. You know, I'd go definite iron supplements if I was going to take that attitude. So, you know. Find out why you're bleeding. You've got to have a reason. The other thing that really, if you can't find any source of bleeding, then what I would suggest is it's due to you eating dairy. Okay, dairy, cow's milk has uh, calcium and phosphorus in it, which complex the iron from other sources like green beans and beef, and they form insoluble complexes of uh, calcium and phosphorus and iron. Not absorbed, you become iron deficient. And plus the milk protein causes microscopic bleeding. So if you haven't found an obvious source of the bleeding that I would think first, next, about you consuming dairy foods. Let's see, is there any other source that, I don't know, I can't think of any other reason that you would have iron deficiency anemia than those. Uh, there, are some, there are some other reasons, like there are certain types of leukemias and you know blood cancers, and, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go looking for that stuff. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from a Lily. I know I'm going to mispronounce this. What do you think of palmiolethanolamide, PEA? It's a compound your body naturally produces in response to pain, inflammation, neuropathy, and cellular stress. Yes, wow, I don't know. That's a new one to me. Okay. Camelos. That's it. Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to bring in the library. The yeah. library team. Um, okay, how about this next question? This is an easy one. This is from Solar Ray, wondering if cataracts can be reversed without surgery. No, no, they can't. Cataracts are scars that are in the lens and they're due to the Western diet. Uh, once the scar formation gets to the point where you ask for help because you can't read, you can't drive, then you avail yourself to an ophthalmologist who's a medical doctor who does cataract surgeries. And it's an amazing surgery and people go from blind to I can see. It's, it's really a wonderful operation if all goes well. You know, sometimes it doesn't. And that's why you wait until you can't take it anymore. That's what your doctor will tell you. Wait till the cataract's right, right, R-I-P-E. And then you come back to me, ma'am or sir, and I will take your diseased, scar-laden lens out, and I'll replace it with a plastic polymer glass type lens that we manufacture. And you will be able to see again. That's wonderful, great, great operation. Uh, how do you get cataracts? Uh, you get them from the food. Um, why do I know that? Well, I'll make a long story short for you. There are probably lots of things in the Western diet that set you up for scar formation in the cornea. But I think one of the more interesting ones has to do with galactose, G-A-L-A-C-T-O-S-E. Galactose comes from lactose. When lactose, the milk sugar breaks down, it breaks down into glucose and galactose. Galactose is a sugar that is toxic to the lens. How do I know that? There's a condition called galactosemia, which is an inherited condition where uh, a person will run really high levels 
of galactose in their blood. They have blinding cataracts in their teens from the toxicity of the galactose. So again, what do you stop eating if you want to avoid cataracts? Lactose, milk, cheese. So you don't end up with, with, a, with a mild galactosemia or a modern galactosemia, et cetera. That, that's the best advice I'd give you to keep the lenses working. And by the way, by the way, I don't know, I didn't tell you this, Mary. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but 10 days ago, we went in we got to get me some new glasses. You guys will see me in new glasses pretty soon. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I, I decided to get an eye exam like, you know, I should do rather than just, you know, getting refraction. I let them look in my eye and look at my lens and et cetera, et cetera. I didn't, I didn't let them dilate my pupils now. You don't want to do that if you're going <laughs> to drive a car or anything like that. But the, that was within reason that the optometrist uh, examined my eyes. And I asked her to look, you know, look at my fundi very carefully to see whether I had a, any atherosclerosis. She said, wow, they look really good. How old are you? Well, you know, I said, how about cataracts? You seen the cataracts in my eyes? She looked and looked and looked and finally came back. She says, oh, I think maybe just a tiny bit. I said, I'll, I'll go with a tiny bit. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I got I passed my eye exam really well, and I'll have new glasses next time you see me. <laughs> I do hope. I hope they're they're coming in the mail. Yeah, yeah all right. You know, it's the food, folks. It's the food. It's the food. <laughs> if you believe me, it's the food. Then you're going to take action. Thank you, Mom. Did you have any luck? I didn't have any luck because I need to have you spell it again. Oh, okay. I, I sent you a text so you, so you can look at it that way. Okay, I'll look at it. Uh, okay, uh, Nick, next question. This is from Cheryl. She's wondering if you can explain intestinal ischemia. Her father died from it after he went to the hospital for a cardiac evaluation and testing. Well, uh, intestinal ischemia is where one of the blood vessels that supply that particular area of the intestine has a heart attack. In other words, a plaque ruptures in the artery supplying the intestine. And as a result, just like when a plaque ruptures in your heart or your brain, you have a stroke or you have a heart attack, a plaque ruptured in an artery that supplied its intestinal tract and that piece of intestinal tract died. Ischemia means low blood supply. So that's likely what happened and whether or not any of the tests that he had encouraged the formation of a plaque rupture or not, I, I, I wouldn't address that. I don't, you know, I, I don't know that that would be the case, but it could be. Hospitals are dangerous places, ladies and gentlemen. You know, people, people get hurt there. You'd be careful. Stay in hospitals. Stay away from doctors. Stay away from drugs. How do you do that? How do you do? How do you do that? How do you stay away from like 80, 90 percent of the problems your friends and neighbors are having? You stop the cause. And what's the cause of heart attacks and strokes and breast cancer and prostate cancer and diabetes? And what's the cause? Well, then listen to me for 48 years, then you know what the cause is. It's the food. And you should expect that you don't have these problems if you started at a young age eating a good diet. Even if you started at an old age, I didn't change my diet until I was like 27 years old. I'd already had a stroke. I was like 80, 80, 90 pounds heavier than I am now. I'd lost my tonsils. I'd had major abdominal surgery. That all happened to me before I was 25 years old. I was on death row, folks. <laughs> but as you, some of you know the story, I discovered the, the true way human beings, true way human beings eat when I lived on a sugar plantation on the Big Island of Hawaii between 1973 and 1976. My F Filipino, Japanese, Chinese, and Korean patients who learned a diet of rice primarily in their native land, and they kept their diet when they moved to the Big Island of Hawaii and they had families. And my older first generation Filipinos, Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans, I never had these problems. Never had heart attacks, never had breast cancer, prostate cancer, or diabetes, never overweight. They were working into their 80s and 90s. But their kids, their kids who gave up the traditional eating of rice and vegetables, they got fatter and sicker. And by the time you got to the third and fourth generation, you're dealing with a population that has a reputation 
of being the most overweight, the most gout infected, infested, gout, gout infested, <laughs> obese, sickly, cancer ridden people on planet Earth. You know, the, the Chinese Americans who live in Hawaii have the highest rate of cancer of any sub ethnic population. The Filipino has the highest rate of gout of any sub ethnic population. Obesity is rampant in Hawaii, just like it is here, except among, except among your Asian families who are just like second or third generation and still maintain a fairly traditional pattern of eating. The Hawaiian people, they gave up their taro and breadfruit and other root vegetables. They gave it up and they ate the, the pigs that the missionaries brought over with enthusiasm and they got very sick. Uh, but, you know, I, what I found in my patient practice uh, when I practiced for 15 years in Hawaii is that uh, many of my Asian patients, they kept their traditional culture and eating, whereas uh, you know, most of the, the white people, what do you say, people of white color? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, they, they uh, and the, the, the people from Hawaii and the Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians, and they're pretty, pretty unhealthy people. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Joyce. She's following your program and wants to know how she can lower her cholesterol. Well, maybe you don't want to. I, I've never seen a patient die of high cholesterol. I, I, I've seen, I personally, I've seen over 12,000 patients. I've never seen anybody die of high cholesterol or high blood sugar or high blood pressure. What are these people who have these signs? These are signs of disease. What do they die of? They die of rotten tissues, of heart attacks, of cancers, etc. So, you know, treating cholesterol results in a low cholesterol. But whether you use statins or uh, bayberry or uh, what are they? Oh, there's all kinds of new ones out. What, what, no matter what drug you use, uh, S, I'm trying to think of SGKPT9s or something. Mm -hmm. I know it's a new one out that costs, costs 10,000 a year. These drugs have not been shown to reduce the risk of dying of heart disease. Okay? Except for statins. Statins have a little bit, but less so every time people look at the research. You're down to the point where you have a matter of a few hours, maybe a few days, Living longer if we lower your cholesterol with, you know, with uh, Lipitor or Crestor or some other type of agent, you'll lower your cholesterol. But the problem isn't the cholesterol. The problem is the food. And the food that causes the arteries to become sick is loaded with cholesterol. So you eat that food, you get sick arteries, and you get a high cholesterol, relatively independent. So anyway, I, 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 you might try, if you need a number, you need, and people do, psychologically, they need a good looking number. Even after I tell them that they're not gonna live any longer by making the number normal or better, or not substantially better, I'll tell you that. We could argue paper by paper, study by study. And I wish I could remember the SGPT 9K something. <laughs> the, the new drugs that are out. The ones advertised on TV. I haven't seen that. You, know, you told me a couple of days ago when I was looking at one. Oh, okay. It was like 10,000 bucks a year. I was just reading the literature on this drug, and it has not been shown to reduce the risk of dying of heart disease. It lowers cholesterol. That's very powerful. Very powerful, this drug. Well, you, know, you can lower your cholesterol, maybe safer by taking berberine, B E R B E R I N E. This is a uh, an herb. A quote, natural drug, lowers cholesterol, probably doesn't reduce your risk of dying of heart disease, but at least you have a good looking number. I see people with cholesterols really high, and I've studied their arteries. You know, people who couldn't take cholesterol lowering medications and had to live with cholesterol, say, 350. Okay, normal would be 150. When we studied their arteries, we did heart scans on them. Not just one or two, but quite a few. And their, their arteries were baby clean. Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, this next question is from Shanna, and she's wondering if you can comment on the McDougal diet for children. Anything special we need to add? I think so. I think, you know, first of all, a child is raised exclusively on a diet that's 50% fat. That's the diet of the first six months of life. It's a diet that's 50% fat. You don't feed anything else but this diet. You don't feed extra water. You don't give them fruit juice. You don't give them dry, um, bottles of heated fruit. What we used to do to the kids, you know, uh, oh, really? applesauce, applesauce and all that stuff. Yeah. You don't do that. What you do is you feed, you feed them the diet for the first six months of life, which is without argument, the diet they're supposed to be on. It's 50% fat. We're called breast milk, in case you didn't catch it so far. It's called human breast milk. Okay, so what happens at six months of age is the, if you remember your children, they get teeth, okay? And they get hands they can reach out and grab. At six months of age, they're in a position of development where what they find in your hand, mother, they're going to grab and eat and be able to do it. So uh, you go from a 50% fat diet down to a diet that's uh, maybe 10% fat, which is what an adult eats and what I recommend. In the process, and, and let's go back, why the diet is so high in fat is because of the tremendous needs of an infant. It's high energy. Uh, it's, uh, you know, they're growing, they're, they've doubled in size in like three to six months, infants do. So you gotta have really some high octane condensed energy there and that's human breast milk. And by the way, that human breast milk is efficiently made by mothers that eat a diet of 10% fat. Okay, they don't run into any problem at all, concentrating that fat from their food to the food of the baby and that comes out of her mammary glands or breasts. All right, so anyway, what the uh, uh, what is generally recommended is that by pediatricians, et cetera, and I think this is a pretty good idea, is that uh, children under the age of two or three years of age should not be on a low-fat diet. All right, they should be, they should be, um, you know, I think 10% fat is just plain and simple too low for uh, little babies. Well, it's okay because you're not supposed to stop breastfeeding until the infant's two to three years old. So they're still getting a good proportion of their food as high fat food and breast milk. So that's okay. But say you stop breastfeeding when the child's six months of age, you're not supposed to. That's not what, what is intended. Uh, you're supposed to breastfeed the baby until, well, like two years of age. Uh, maybe you could stop at one year, you know, you get away with it, Man, maybe a year and a half. But otherwise you get into trouble with the children if you stop breast milk too early. So it takes until they're about two years of age before they become efficient enough to stop this high fat source. Say you're one of the modern people who doesn't think you're going to offer your breasts to the baby. Okay, I don't want to go any further than that because I really get upset about this. Uh, anyway, you decide you're going to make that decision. I would suggest you add a, a source of plant fat to the kid's diet. And that's not a recommendation. It's not something you should uh, consider uh, a, a, a sensible substitute. There's no substitute for human breast milk. So anyway, I, I think you gotta pay attention. You're gonna breastfeed the kid two or three years of age. Um, the kid's gonna start grabbing food out of your hand as of six months of age. Make sure you got potatoes and rice and et cetera uh, in your hands. Didn't you do a whole newsletter or a whole section my, on this? My January, 2011 newsletter. Okay. Thank you. Can you comment on Sjogren's syndrome? Sjogren's. Sjogren's is an autoimmune disease. Uh, it was named after a guy. I'm sure his name was Sjogren. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, it, you know, it's the salivary glands, which are here, which make spit, and the lacrimal glands, which make tears. What happens is the body makes antibodies to these glandular tissues, and any glandular tissues in the body would uh, it attacks. And there are other places where you have plant sugar tissue, not just the salivary and the lacrimal glands. And it destroys the, these glands because the body makes antibodies and attacks them. Once destroyed, it's gone. They're not going to come back. 
you know, you'd have to have artificial tears or, uh, you know, chew gum or you have some type of way to moisture your, your mouth. And it's tough to live without spit. So uh, you ask, well, how do you get this? Uh, why does the body attack itself? It really sounds stupid, the body attacking itself. Well, it is. It's not the right thing for the body to do to attack itself. It attacks itself because you damage the immune system and you damage the gut barrier. And what happens is you end up eating foreign salivary glands and lacrimal glands. And how do you eat foreign salivary glands and lacrimal glands? Hot dogs. Hot dogs. Hot dogs. Hot dogs. They, they, they don't waste pepperoni. Pepperoni pizza will do it too. <laughs> they, they, they waste nothing in a slaughterhouse. And so you end up eating foreign salivary glands from cows and pigs. This is foreign. You are not a cow or pig. The body can distinguish between cows and pigs under our salivary glands and your salivary gland when the immune system is intact, when the gut barrier is intact. But when you eat the American diet, you damage so many systems that the immune system does not respond as specifically as it could and should. When it's out looking for the cow and pig salivary glands or lacrimal glands, it stumbles on your salivary glands and lacrimal glands and go up, oh, there it is, foreign. It, it gets confused, it's called molecular mimicry. Molecular mimicry, you know, like molecule, like copy mimicry. And you can look it up, uh, you'll read for days on it about how molecular mimicry causes autoimmune diseases and food is the source. Not always, it could be a virus that introduces a foreign protein, could be a bacteria that introduces a foreign protein, but food is the, is the cause almost all the time. Thank you. Okay, here's another one, food related, diverticulitis. Okay, well that? that's, yeah, that's, that's where you have little out pouches of the uh, intestinal tract, they're called diverticuli. They're little balloons that get blown out in your intestinal tract. They most commonly occur mm -hmm. in the large intestine, particularly the last part of the large intestine. How, how common are they? Well, you know, 40 to 50% of the population that eats the Western diet ends up with diverticular disease. Uh, these little po pockets, they get infected, so you get diverticulitis, which we call left-sided appendicitis because it acts like appendicitis. These pouches, these diverticuli, they, they break out next to a blood vessel because that's the weakest part of the bowel wall is where a vessel pokes through. So they break out and as a result, bleeding is a common sign of having diverticular disease. In fact, I've been on operations where the only way to save the person's life was to cut a couple of feet of uh, large intestine out because they were bleeding to death and we saved them. But anyway, that's how you get it. You get it from a low fiber diet. What happens is when you eat a high fiber diet like ours, the bowel contracts at large diameters. When you eat a low fiber diet, like 10 grams a day, as opposed to 120 grams a day, when you eat a low fiber diet, you end up making just a little tiny, what I call rock hard fecal marble. It's a little tiny fellow. And <laughs> you have to contract at these small diameters. And there's a physical law called the law of Laplace, which says when you contract at small diameters, you create large pressures. And so that's how you get the blowout of the balloons called diverticuli. Can you do something about it even if you have them? Yes, you can. You can stop the bleeding and you can stop the infections by putting good food in the large intestine. And then you don't have problems with bleeding and infection as often and maybe never if you eat a good diet. You don't have them cut out unless they're causing you problems. You don't treat them unless they're causing you problems. Okay, Heather, it's six o'clock. Perfect timing. Thank you. I, 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 I hope we didn't out. waste everybody's evening today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. But you know, when I get when I get something on my mind, I know you were interested in weight, but I was interested in the fact that we have we have a, a serious problem. It's called global boiling. It's not global warming anymore. He he read that in the newspaper today, so I knew he was going to have to talk about it. I have to talk about it. And you need to pay attention. You need to tell everybody you know about Mir. 
M E E R dot org. Yi Tao, you'll meet him. He's a genius. And I'll put on an interview that I did with Yi Tao this past week. And uh, I, I think it's time to listen to this world leader. He's, just, he's too smart. He's too smart. He's, he's so hard to understand because he's so smart. Well, I'm going to calm him down. I'm going to get teach him how to teach <laughs> teach the common public. And he's got to learn that skill. Yeah. He's, he's a genius. He's got, a, he's got a way out of this, folks. It's not going to be easy. It's going to require everybody's effort, but good grief. You know, it's not like we have another home. What are you going to do? Anyway, thank you, Heather. We're going to have a, another program, not for a while, because we have... We've got this, a lot going uh, on, but we've got another, we've got our second event in our series. Our McDougal's Medicine Series is next Saturday. That's going to be on diabetes. And then we'll also be meeting up with all of you next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. So we've got a busy week. And then October. Here. Oh, and our next course, our next 12 days, October 13th. So we're and taking the last, now. The last one was a sellout. We were over, <laughs> overfilled. Over, over sellout. <laughs> that was great. Okay. All right. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for tuning in. It was a great hour. We'll see you all next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. Thank you.